Disciple of Christ podcast. I am here today. I'm going to make you say your own name. You ready for it? I have on the show with me today Mark Curtis, also known as Corn Dodger. And if you, and, and I'm doing post production right now, putting a picture of a Corn Dodger on there. On nice. on a thing or two, I find you as Corn Dodger. And tell me what inspired that. Um, nothing really. I've never designed to to go by an alias. I'm I'm okay with who I am. You know. Um, however, I was compiling a project for a site called Hemlock Knots, and it was just a lot of people's research streamlined and organized into a way that just made more sense. And so I wasn't the author of it, so I felt bad putting my name on it because it really wasn't entirely my work. And uh, the Corn Dodger fit the Hemlock Knots quote, and so I just thought, here I am, a weak piece of bread getting smashed to pieces, you yeah. know, trying to get things into the heads of this generation. I love so, that. I, I love that quote. I'm going to see if I can find it specifically and just put it on the screen. But the short version of it, Joseph Smith expressing his frustration, getting anything into the saints of this generation is like trying to split hemlock knots. In other words, logs with big knots inside of them using a corn dodger as a wedge and a pumpkin as a beetle. That's a messy process. Yeah, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so people can find it, Hemlock Knots is a great resource with, with an impressive timeline on the subject of polygamy. Are there other subjects with a timeline on Hemlock Knots? Um, there's a few others, but honestly, the, the doctrinal Christ stuff has been the majority of my time and focus. So I'd like to get back to that one day, but I've got about 30 different Google documents um, with source material that I need to post on Hemlock Knots. So it's not just about polygamy. Isn't it's, it? It's about everything Joseph taught and everything we teach today organized into timelines so people can get in and study the source material. I like <clears throat> I like how cantankerous you can come across at times because I don't view it as cantankerous, but I know it'll get Thanks. perceived as that. Here, <laughs> here's what I appreciate about Mark Curtis, very sincerely. You place a higher priority on what are the facts of the matter, much more so than, than the emotions of it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean... And that's only because I spent my first 38 years of my life relying on my emotions and found myself in a dark and dreary waste as a result of that. So the fruits of that for me didn't pan out as well as studying the word of God um, and appealing to, to his word. His word is sharp and powerful to the dividing asunder, you know, marrow and, and joint or whatever it says in the scriptures. Like my word is not, his is. I'm going to use his as much as I can because that adds power to any message that I can ever convey, right? I'll let God speak for himself. He doesn't need me in the way. You and I right now are located in the, the hills area, a little bit south of Provo. There's a little bit of mystery in some of the mountains around here. One of the things that's amazing about Utah, there's different kinds of folklore, rumors, even legends about things buried in the mountains here <laughs> with some, some fruits to examine, oftentimes with less than convincing results. But it's a amazing place where we are at. Yeah, um, I didn't know this until after I had moved here. But you know, according to legend, I don't know which you know book this came from, but something about the the invading armies not being able to cross this Salem Canal, you know. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, with all of our <laughs> modern technology and warfare, it's good to know that that little canal is going to save me up here. You're not going to be able to send the helicopters over. So we're in Utah right now. Are you native to Utah? Um, yes and no. So I grew up in Texas until I was about 12 years old and then we moved out here, but my parents were from Utah growing up. They had moved out to Texas on a job. And so family roots, yes, we are Utah folks. Um, however, I've been in and out of Utah lots of times. I've lived in Louisville, Kentucky, San Diego for a little time. Um, you know, two years in, in Seattle area for my mission. Um, yeah, I've, I've been lots of different places. So growing up until age 12 in Texas, is there a, an accent that hides inside of there from time to time? Yeah, apparently there was. So when I moved here to Utah in sixth grade in elementary school, it was brutal. They're like, why do you talk so weird? Like, <laughs> say that again. That sounded cool. You know, and I'm like, you guys sound weird personally. But um, I said things like fixin'. Hey, guys, we're fixing to go to the store. Get your shoes on. <laughs> and people were just blown. They thought that was hilarious. And I don't, I'm not sure why. To this day, I still think it makes sense as a word. I like, I like it as a yeah. word. Were you raised in the LDS environment? Yes, very much so. So my father was a bishop when I was in Texas. So ever since I was young, I mean, when I was baptized at age eight, my dad was the bishop of that ward. I think all the way up until um, I left at about age 11 or 12, you know, so very LDS. You know, we had 
people over three or four times a week, Relief Society functions. My dad would have his counselors come over. So our house was always this busy place of just churchy stuff, you know. In other words, it was the way of life that you grew up in. Absolutely, yeah. We had we had missionaries over at least once a week, it felt like, you know. Boy Scouts? Um, yeah, so I was a Boy Scout for a time, but I didn't finish my stuff in time, so I was a life scout. I never got my eagle done, but, you know, I like scouts. Now, uh, at age 12, when you moved away from Texas, <clears throat> did you feel like you had a testimony? Think about your 12-year-old analysis of things. Would you say that you believed in the church or had a testimony at that time? Um, not, not a personal one, but, you know, culturally, yeah, it just made sense what our family did. I never questioned it per se until much later, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was on board with it. It made sense. Came here to Utah. Did that testimony continue to grow and you <laughs> angels ministered to you, right? Um, no, it, that was a really tough move for me. In fact, um, I was exposed to a lot of things, not being able to find really good friends in Utah. Um, some bullying. I started getting made fun of. It was that awkward teenage phase and, you know, middle school is brutal on most people. So, um, I didn't do that very well. So I distanced myself a little bit from, from the core Latter-day Saints in my neighborhood. And, and maybe that was a mistake looking back on it, but, um, but yeah. So, uh, you know, that was the main driver for me distancing myself from the church and the doctrines and the gospel because I was going through so much personal stuff, you know? People can find the doctrineofchrist.com and they're going to find a lot of podcasts. There's one of, there's a couple of them in particular where you dive in deep in the scriptures. The one most recently viewing ourselves in our own carnal state. You, you had, you had what you recognize as an intervention to where you were on a path that was probably going <laughs> to tell me, tell me about what it was like in your teenage years, just not caring, exploring your own your own way. Yeah. I mean, simply put, I was just lost. I mean, I, I'm not alone. I know there's a lot of teenagers that go through this, you know, identity crisis. What am I doing here? What's the purpose of life? This is, you know, but I was caught up in, you know, hanging out with kind of a rougher crowd, um, listening to a ton of music I shouldn't have been listening to. Um, just caught up in the normal teenage stuff for most boys that are, that are not centered on the gospel. Um, you know, I never got into sexual immorality. Thank goodness. That was never a thing that I explored, but, um, you know, drinking and partying and doing drugs and things I experimented with for several years. And it was part of my regular jam. I got into some, you know, vandalism and just troublemaking, you know, uh, we'd, we'd go out and pick fights with kids and just stuff that's just not very Christian. Um, and so that's where I found myself was just tired and exhausted with that lifestyle of just Is this 16 ish, 18 ish. Um, I'd say 16 to, well, 16 to 19 was, what were the worst years? culminating they got progressively worse until i was 19 but that's when i finally had that experience where i woke up was, was there anything during those years were you looking into the future well i'm gonna i'm gonna change later but right now would you rationalize things that way you know i deep down inside if i were to be honest with myself as a teenager i knew what i was doing was wrong there's no doubt about it however that guilt i resented and so i worked extra to make sure that i cut off all of this stuff that's bringing me shame and guilt. I didn't want the reminders every week that I was in a bad place. And so what I did is I just cut them off. You know, it's like your check engine light. When it comes on, you put a little piece of duct tape over it, <laughs> fixed it, you know, but I thought sticking my head in the sand would, would make me feel better. And, um, I think it just snowballed into something much worse. Okay. You, you, yeah. What led to you recognizing that God was looking out for you or had an interest in you? Um, it really was, you know, when I had that major turnaround event, that conversion event, if you will, when I was 19, it was a desperate Hail Mary prayer. I mean, I, I didn't even know that God existed. Give us what was leading up to that. You were, you were in deep distress. It lead up to all of a sudden realizing I might have messed up permanently. Um, long story short, I overdosed on LSD. Um, three days prior. And so I spent three days with no sleep, completely out of my mind. And, you know, I'd done those things before. I know you sober up the next day. But in this particular case, I had gone three days with no sleep. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't even speak to people. Everybody's laughing at me when I was trying to communicate with them. And they were like, oh my gosh, what have, what happened to Mark? Like, he, should we take him to a hospital? You know, he, he's not, he's not normal. And so I started to hear those things and think, I, I'm pretty sure I just ruined my life. Like I'm, I'm going to become 
you know, mentally incapacitated because of this drug that I took. Um, and so I was in a state where I'm like, I completely threw my life away. Did you, as you try to remember those days, did it make sense in your mind what you were trying to communicate or was it even difficult for you to put thoughts in a linear fashion? In regards to, in other words, while I was intoxicated. Yeah, well, so you're having three days where you realize I'm not back to normal. Did it, did anything, did it seem like you could think thoughts clearly for yourself as you try to analyze your circumstances? I mean, not really because I, I was, I was so depressed and so sad. I mean, I was just so broken. Like I was, I literally thought the rest of my life I would be in this state, this kind of a vegetable, so to speak. Um, I mean, I was even trying to commit suicide, but I didn't know how I couldn't find stuff to do it with. I was trying and it was failing. And I was just like, I, I'm such an idiot right now. There was enough in my brain to know that what I'm trying to do, I can't do. My capacities were just so limited. Um, and I imagine that's the frustration from a lot of people who are, who have handicaps, right? I mean, their body just won't obey the brain. You're depressed. You're thinking about suicide. Don't even really know how to do it. Your brain's not cooperating. So what happened? Um, so, I mean, I knew that I was at wit's end. I'm, I'm like, I'm either going to go out with a bang, so to speak, pun intended, or else I, I need to make some major 180 changes. Like I can't do this anymore. So I wanted a fresh start. And I was so sorry in my heart that I, I went to the Lord in that prayer. This is the first prayer in, in a number of years that, was, that I'd done. And just begged him for another chance. And I said, I'll make you a promise. If you can give me another chance and rescue me and save me from this condition I'm in, um, I'll become a disciple. And I didn't even know what that entailed. <laughs> I even said in my prayer... But you prayer, knew it meant a commitment. You knew it was a commitment. Well, I was in LDS brain at the time, and, that, and that's okay. Um, but I made a deal with him. I, I, I will even go on a mission. <laughs> and so my, my prayer that night was more like, hey, um, God, if you're there and you care, like, I'll tell you what. If you can get me out of this and you listen to prayers and you're a real thing like they say you are, yeah, I'll become a Christian. I'll do the churchy stuff. But, you know, I don't even remember finishing the prayer, and I fell asleep that night, and I slept from probably 2 or 3 in the morning until, like, 11. So I got a good night's rest, and I was actually still in the same position I was praying in when I woke up, just leaning on the bed, just kind of tired, you know. There was no kneeling or folding arms involved. But, you know, for me, um, the next morning I woke up 100% healed, whole, no hangover, crystal clear mind. And... I knew I was in trouble <laughs> and I was a part what did, of what did I sign up for? <laughs> well, it's like, great. Like now I've got to do this religious stuff, which I don't like. And, uh, I didn't know where to start. I didn't know the scriptures. I didn't, I just knew I should probably go on a mission because that's what 19 year olds do where I'm from. Um, so I was like, tell me about the changes that started to happen. And did it, did these changes at least in your behavior happen fast? Oh yeah, they had to. So that first day I was like, Oh, is there a chance this could have been just me wearing off naturally? Like, was this a miracle? I, I believed it was. And I believe that God knew that I knew that it was. So I was kind of trapped <laughs> as grateful as I was to be whole. I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of joy from the darkest depression. I woke up and just felt on fire with light and just I loved life I went for a walk around the neighborhood and the birds and the clouds and the mountains were just so beautiful I mean it really was um, a spiritual rebirth of sorts but I had none of the foundational knowledge to know what that was and why it happened it was it was crazy you know but that day I spent that afternoon calling each of my friends that I was partying with the last three days and what would you tell them I just said I'm done I can't I'm not going to be around anymore. I'm taking a hiatus. Um, I appreciate the years we had together, you know, I, I, no hard feelings, but I'm, I'm not going to be hanging out with this crew anymore. You severed old ties. I had to. Yeah. I felt compelled to do that immediately. Um, because it was, you know, it was, their influence didn't make it any easier on me. And, um, you know, my overdose was, was due partially to a, a, a practical joke, a prank <laughs> attempted murder, basically, you know, I was 130 pounds. I mean, this is st one dose is enough to make a, a grown man yeah. crazy. But this was, you know, I'd taken three or four doses that were 
golly, it's just too much for any human being to take. Um, so I had to get out of that. That was the first sacrifice I think I had to make was to cut ties with friends. After that, I had to, you know, I called my family into a little family council meeting within a couple of days. And I just said, hey, here's what I've been into. Boom, boom, boom. I'm a terrible person. Here's why. Any questions? And, and you're not doing it in a way, because you and I are familiar with when people are putting things out in the open, there always is a temptation to wear let me reveal things in a way that doesn't really reveal everything. It sounds like you were just... Oh, I revealed th- everything. Yeah. I held nothing back. And my family, jaws were dropping thinking, we had no idea. <clears throat> and I'm like, I know. <laughs> That's would, how distant I was from my own family. What, what you know? would you say caused the jaws to drop the most? Um, I think it was just how deep I was into the drug scene and the party. I mean, they were, they were an LDS family. Um, boy... <laughs> I mean, some of them sort of knew, like the car would smell funny, you know. <laughs> um, Is there a skunk around here? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, but like, I don't think they knew that it was to that level. And I don't think they knew that I was to the point of um, contemplating ending it. I think they just, it snuck up on them. They knew that something was wrong, that I was unhappy, that I was edgy. And that I had this rebellious streak in me. But I think they just thought I was going through a phase that was a little bit more benign than it was, you know. A lot of people talk about hearing the voice of the Lord. You haven't described any of that. It sounds like you recognized an intervention on your behalf. Yeah, and I don't don't feel... What's hard about this is I don't feel like I should have had that. I didn't have faith. I I, I wasn't doing anything right at the time. And that's why I'm so fixated on the concept of grace and why I testify of it so much. Because, like, Alma the Younger didn't deserve what he had either. Neither did Paul. And I'm not suggesting that I'm one of them, but, you know, God can pull you out of things very, very quickly and put you back on your feet. For me, it was overnight. I mean, like, I believe in the transformative power of the atonement, and I also believe that there's nothing we can do to merit that um, in and of ourselves, you know, because I, I had something given to me at age 19 that I certainly didn't deserve, and I recognize that, and I can't forget that lesson. Uh, preparing to go on a mission. Did, did you serve a mission? Yeah. Where? To Tacoma, Washington. So it's the Western Peninsula, um, west of Seattle, all the way to the ocean. You know, beautiful land up there. It's gorgeous. Did you feel that you were prepared as a mission? In, in other words, let me ask it a couple of ways. What did you no. feel your mission was supposed to accomplish? I went on a mission initially to repay a debt. Yeah. Out of, I did not want to go. It horrified me, the thought of going. But again, I was bound to that promise I made with God. And I'm like, okay, going on a mission, I guess. I'm just going to bite the bullet and go. But I was incredibly ignorant of the scriptures. And just there were people in the NPC that just made me look like garbage as far as knowledge and understanding even how the church operates. Um, I mean, I would talk about the church and... Uh, Just people were like, no, like that's what your state president does. That's not, you know, Um, so I just, it took me a while to piece things together, but I'll tell you what, I I dove into the Book of Mormon. I took three institute classes about six months before I went on my mission, three a week. And that's when the fire started to light within me where it's like, wow, these books are pretty cool. I still don't know much about them, but like I was feeling that they're important. So when I got into the MTC and the mission, like I hit the books hard as far as the scriptures go. And I think that helped me. What did you find yourself connecting with in the scriptures? Um, the scriptures for me were something I could relate to all the talk about grace and salvation and the Lord saving his people and faith and repentance. I mean, that stuff made sense to me because I had, I had seen that I had tangible proof in my life that that stuff works. Right. And so that, I think that enabled me to go into people's living rooms and just beg them to repent and to take this seriously. And I'm telling you, there's a brighter side to life that you have not seen yet. But you have, you have to come low and understand that you're in a terrible situation just by birth. All of us natural fallen man were, were earmarked for destruction by nature. And that's, that's not very good news. And that's why the gospel is such good news, because that can save you from your natural state of just decay. You know, the natural man will 
will self implode and decay in time, right? As I'm finishing the editing for part one of Mark's interview, I want to say thank you so much for sharing, liking, and subscribing. Please leave a comment down below. It helps YouTube share this video with more people. If it is not for you, it just won't grow. So thank you for all that you do. Back to the conversation. In your adult life, <clears throat> did you have... Did you have moments where you felt like I've got to rededicate myself or I've got to take this, I've got to take this more seriously. And, and, and let me just flesh out a couple of thoughts in general. It is so tempting to stay in a constant state of distraction or amusement. It's fun, especially that we've got digital screens. We can pull up images of whatever we want at any time. I've loved watching guitar videos or, or fuzz pedal demos, things like that. Did you find yourself feeling like, hey, I've got to do something more with my life other than whatever the normal is, secure some financial resources and have as much fun as I can? I mean, I, I lost my way on my mission. I became arrogant and proud. The church became my salvation. How did and you, I allowed myself to get into that mindset. Did you recognize that you were arrogant as a missionary? No. I thought I was righteous and whole. I mean, I had leadership positions early on. I mean... It, I was made an AP like 13 months into my mission and it was like, wow, Elder Curtis is a mate. So I had all this like pride tugging at me and I didn't handle it very well. I was very, I didn't have a lot of friends in high school. I was a reject. And so I never, I never had acceptance really from social circles um, until I was a missionary. And I think I was not prepared to handle <laughs> to get that out of my system. So when I returned home from my mission, I did have an arrogance about me that was, I am more righteous. I baptized more people. I, you know, I, it was the wrong, the wrong way. I got, I got totally into, you know, the church leadership and one day I'm going to become a, a general authority. I mean, that, that stuff creeps into a lot of elders minds, but you know, when I got home, it was more about like, how can I prove my righteousness by my works? And I got, I'll admit, I'm not proud of it, but I got sucked up into that. And I stayed there for a number of years until I was about 37, 36, 37, 38 years old, I started realizing that uh, there's no, th there's no fruits in this. It's not working. When you say there's no fruits in this, what were you expecting from fruits? What were you, think about when the awakening was first happening. What do you mean? No fruits. I wasn't joyful. I wasn't happy. I would take the 19 year old kid any day after the wake up compared to where, where I was today, having done because when I was 19, I thought, I am trash. I am garbage. Like, I'm nobody. Isn't that an awful way of thinking of but it? But I thought I was somebody at age 35, and yet the joy that came from that 19-year-old experience of waking up was gone. It, it, was, it was empty. I was doing a lot of stuff on the hamster wheel, um, just trying to find meaning and God's hand in what I was doing in the church. And there was, there were little glimpses of it, of course. So but. let me ask this. In other words, 35 years old, you're still active in the church. I'm guessing you, you might be having local leadership callings. Very active. Yeah. So, I mean, lots of callings and you know, nothing really big. I never led a congregation, did it, but did, did it resemble your, your family's life growing up there in Texas to where, Hey, there's always church activities inside and outside of the house. It's just our way of life. Uh -huh. We're very busy with all of the th things that seem like, well, this is what we do as members of the church. Cause this shows that we're following God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was things, there was ward mission leader, um, elders quorum presidency. Um, I taught elders quorum and gospel doctrine. Um, and I was happy to, however, when I read the scriptures in my private life, in my bedroom, I'm reading about people having mighty miracles and mighty changes of heart and spiritual outpourings and angels and revelations and just there's a magic about the scriptures where I'm thinking like, I want that gospel, not the one I'm getting every Sunday, but like, I want to be one of these people in this book. That sounds awesome. Like, I want to get back to that somehow. And that's where it started to get me rethinking my strategy on leaning too much into the, the institution or the organization itself and going back to finding God because I knew you could find God without the church. I did it as a 19 year old. Does that make sense? Yes. So the church to me was like this thing that I had snapped on to my relationship with God. And I think it got in the way and maybe I'm, I'm living the gospel wrong or, or I was a wrong kind of Mormon or whatever. But to me, I'm like, I got to get back to the foundational roots of just connecting with God 
and not letting all the stuff get in the way, you know? So what <clears throat> steps did you end up going through in your search to know God? <clears throat> well, there, I was starting to feel that lowliness of heart again, where I'm like, look, this is not working. I, I feel like I'm reaching another dead end in my life. And I wasn't suicidal at this point. You know, I was more stable. However, um, I had to, I had to ask myself the hard questions. Like if this, if I'm doing all this stuff to the best of my ability and wearing myself out, following all these rules and commandments and guidelines from the church hand, you know, I was, I was doing it all really well, going to the temple every week. Um, Either I'm doing it wrong or the gospel's wrong or the church is wrong. I'm like, which one? Like, Some, something's, something's misfiring. Broken. Something's broken and I'm about to fix it. So, And I took on the responsibility of, it, it's, it's my fault. I'm doing this wrong. What am I doing wrong, God? Show me where I went off track and show me how I can get back to that place I was at as a young man that just newly woke up and had that fire and that zeal. Um, I really wanted that back, and it had been decades since I'd felt that. Okay, so this is just a few years ago. Um, yeah, three, three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago. What happened differently? In other words, were you finding this like the Lord's lone soldier, he's intervening, <clears throat> or are you finding yourself with like-minded individuals? Oh, no, I was kind of, I was associating with, uh, you know, all my Latter-day Saint neighbors and ward members, and um, I hadn't met anybody that I associate with now, as far as learning the gospel, I found myself one night, you know, Yvette went to bed and I told her, I'm going to stay up a little bit and study some scriptures. It was in my living room and I was studying from probably, you know, 10 30 or so until like one in the morning. But I went down the rabbit hole of the baptism of fire and the Holy ghost. And I just started reading every scripture I could find on it. And let me just ask, had anybody planted the seed about that topic specifically, or is this something that stuck out to you on its own? You know, I had heard, I'd been listening to a lot of stuff, a lot of podcasts, and I'd heard here and there that like, you have to have this and that you didn't get it when you were eight. You know, I sort of had the idea that this was something bigger than what I thought I already had. Um, and so I just, I stumbled across it, but then I went down the rabbit. I didn't sit down and think I'm going to study this tonight, this topic, but I started cross-referencing and looking things up on my phone and reading a bunch of stuff. And my jaw just kept dropping more and more with every verse. And I just thought, have I, I don't think I've had this. That's what's missing. I need that to happen to me. I need to be baptized. And so I asked the Lord, Hey, um, have I, have I been baptized yet? Meaning like by the Holy ghost. And I don't get answers a lot, but my answer was no, you haven't. And I knew I hadn't. I'm reading these passages. I'm like, yeah, that's not me, right? Um, but then I just thought, well, I got the gift of the Holy Ghost when I was eight. So I, you know, I have the church membership records that I could prove that I have the Holy Ghost, but I don't feel <laughs> it, you know? Um, so, I mean, that was the prayer that and, I had that And let night. me ask, what did you think was supposed to be different? If I had the gift of the Holy Ghost, I would be seeing or experiencing such and such. What was it? I mean, it was, it was that remission of sins and that joy and that mighty change of heart. King Benjamin's address I read over a couple times that night. And man, that sermon just rocked my world. And I thought, that describes more of how I felt when I was 19 more than today. So I'm like, I'm, I'm living backwards. Benjamin Button, I'm going backwards in time and getting darker, you know. The more I double down on my works and activity in the church and all this temple stuff... Um, I was fooling myself and I knew that God knew it. You know, I wasn't very honest with myself. I was pretending a lot. And so I was ready to, again, take off the facade of pretension and do things the Lord's way. I found what actions did it lead you to as you're trying to take off this facade and present yourself sincerely to the Lord, what changed in your lifestyle? So when I prayed that night that I was studying the whole baptism of fire and the Holy ghost, I, I first got the answer that I hadn't been baptized. And so that was kind of depressing. It was like, oh, shoot. Well, then a feeling came over me that I needed to repent of pretending that I was somebody that I wasn't for decades. Like I felt bad about being deceived about that. So I told the Lord, I'm sorry, you know, I'm ready to 
relearn the gospel. I, I, and I made, another, made another deal with the Lord. This is like a covenant. Like, Heavenly Father, I am all in as a disciple. I, I'm going to give as much as I can to you. I'm not perfect, of course, but what you see is what you get. And if you're cool with that, um, I'm going to rededicate myself as a disciple and do anything that you ask me to do. However, as a result, can you help me get back to where I was when I was 19? Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's it another deal it, I made with him. You know, it, it seems like this covenant, kind of, this kind of commitment, because it is a covenant that you're making. So, 19 seemed more like if you're there, can you help me out? Now it seems to be more of an awareness, the agreement that you're making. Yeah. I'm like, I know you're there, but I I've moved, not you shame on me for allowing myself to be swept up in all these other things and neglecting my relationship with you. And so, you know, I, at that, that night I made what sort of, it resembled a couple weeks later. I, I, my prayer sort of resembled in a way, Alma 18 baptismal covenant where I said, heavenly father, I'm willing to now try to help the poor. I'm, I'm willing now to try to take people under my arm and, and, and befriend people who are lonely. I'm going to try to be a better dad and stepdad. I'm going to try to be a better husband. I'm going to really try to do the things that I know that I should have been doing all along, but that I've been lax in, in doing. And so that was my way of saying, Heavenly Father, I'm all in. Um, but you know, help me, help me figure this out. So I was repenting and I asked Heavenly Father to forgive me for getting off track and allowing anything to come between me and him. And in this case, it was like the church traditions. So, oh, sorry. I believed that for 20 years. Um, but that's when I started to have an experience in a, a baptism of fire of sorts where my heart started to swell and to burn within me. I felt the energy and the radiation of, of the power of heaven sweep over my entire body. And it's, it, it was a half an hour experience at one o'clock in the morning and it ended at about one thirty, one thirty two. In fact, I, when it was over, I looked at the clock and I saw that, but man, there was a radiating power and a, and a joy that swept over me. Um, I didn't hear a voice, but I knew that the Lord was forgiving me of my sins in that moment. And there was a time when I was praying and I asked Heavenly Father that this is wonderful, that this is great. I love this. I haven't felt this in decades. And I said, give me more of it, bring it on, send me every, <laughs> like, and I actually said to him, I am ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And that was, that's what led to this really great outpouring of, of just, I don't, it was a feeling. It was a sensation. It was a, I felt my body was being energized by something greater than myself. There's no way I could have ever manufactured those types of feelings. Did it feel like you were being connected with, with a greater kind of existence? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I knew it was the power of heaven. No doubt about it. Um, and even during the prayer, you know, I kept my eyes closed and I was just on my couch, just basking in this thing. I didn't want it to end in my mind. I was thinking, no way. Like this is, <laughs> this is really <laughs> happening to me. This is great. Like, I, can we, can we keep going for hours? Like I want to, how far can I take this thing? Um, you know, there were even times when I looked down at my hands, you know, like while I was in this state and I expected them to be glowing or transfigured. Like there was an energy in my hands and arms and legs and just everywhere, mostly in my hands. And so of course I looked down and there were nothing, just a regular hand, disappointing, but, um, but I felt the energy as if I was being illuminated from the inside out. Not in any mystical way, but like in a very practical, like there was an energy about my, my body that I just, I've hard to describe. I'd never felt anything like that before. So let me ask this. I, there's plenty of people who would like to rationalize an experience like that where you're in a specific meditative state. Would it affect how you'd go about your days after that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, mean, I went to bed. I wrote in my journal that night for about 45 minutes about the experience. And then I went to bed. And even waking up in the morning, I mean, I had this insane desire to pray. I couldn't wait to pray when I woke up, <laughs> right? Yeah. Not like me at all. Like, again, this is 
mighty change that's starting to happen. Because it's so easy for us to get into the whole perfunctory, oh, it's morning time, let me say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I gotta get ready if, for work. If, if we say it at all. Yeah, and so I was working from home at the time, and so I had until like 9 or 9.30 before I had to really show up and, and do some things. But, um, you know, I just, there, for a couple weeks there, I was, I was in a point where I couldn't get enough scripture study, I couldn't get enough prayer. Every waking hour of the day, I wanted to talk to my kids about the gospel, my wife, and it was just like, I was on fire. Now, that honeymoon phase, it faded, and I started wrestling with things. And it Over was the like, course of days or weeks? I think weeks, you know, it, got, it just sort of, there was a, the first week it was, it was awesome. I would go upstairs and I would do prayers that lasted 30, 40 minutes sometimes and pointed answers. I was studying the scriptures and things were just jumping out at me. Um, I mean, I thought I knew the scriptures pretty well until that moment, but after that it was, you know, I felt like I had a gift or some help from heaven in piecing together some of the, some of the teachings, the doctrine of Christ, quote unquote, that we always refer to. That jumped out of the pages of these scriptures almost immediately. The weeks after this experience, I was learning the doctrine of Christ. Can, can you summarize what were these steps that stuck out and how clear was it for you? Uh, I don't think I had a, a list, a to-do list given to me from God. I don't, I've never felt that God wanted to tell me what to do every morning. You know, for me, it was like, I know what I need to do. I've, I've read this stuff. God's telling me to come unto him and repent and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple in that regard where it's like every morning you wake up, you roll out of bed, and you think, like Moroni 7 says, if it brings people to believe in Christ, it's good. Seek after and embrace every good thing. Lay hand upon all good things. And so I just got busy again. You know, I didn't have some major sacrifice. The Lord didn't tell me to go give up my car or to sell my house and move somewhere. I mean, sometimes he does that. But for me, it was like, you just need to get involved in preaching my gospel, learning it first, and then preaching it second. Don't speak of tenants, speak nothing but repentance to this generation. And I try to keep it pretty focused on, on the doctrine of Christ as much as I can. Right. So I just started getting to work and yeah, I'm not perfect. I get angry still. And I, you know, I, I make mistakes and I sin and I have to repent constantly about certain things. And I, I'm just constantly reminded that I still have a fallen nature. I wrestle with pride a lot. Um, but there are different kinds of sins. I mean, my, my disposition to do evil, I would say is like, I don't want to do anything bad. Whereas before it was like, let me see if I can watch this raunchy movie. I'm strong <laughs> enough to, you know. And so I was sort of flirting with the edge of like, I was enticed by evil. And, uh, you know, and, and this happened to me and it's the desire to, I mean, even when you see a, a like an immoral picture pop up, even accidentally or on a show, it's like gross. Like turn that off. Like I'm repulsed by some of that stuff now where it's like, you know, my whole life I'd wrestled with in and out of those types of things. And I was, you know, tempted now, by them. And do you recognize it as your nature is being changed? Um, yeah. And again, I'm not a hundred percent there, but I'm 80 to 90% there as far as being able to control some of those appetites that once governed me, you know, when you say I feel 80 to 90% there, what would you recognize as being there per se? I mean, there's stuff that I have completely given up for the last four years that are literally not even a problem anymore. The temptation there is gone. And I think that's what King Benjamin's people, he was referring to there, was like the disposition to do evil goes away. And you, have a, you now have a desire to wake up in the morning and do good. That's what changed about me, is, is I was... I wasn't seeking out the lusts of the flesh and, and how to have fun and be entertained as much. It was just like I woke up and I had work to do, but that work was way more fun than any of the other crap I'd been doing for decades, you know? You're continuing to have this change. The scriptures are sticking out. Desire to do evil is, is no longer the same kind of nature that you had before. Um, as you're studying the doctrine of Christ... Did it lead you to desire to be baptized by water, to be baptized by fire and by the Holy Ghost? What happened in your life as this continual waking up to God is happening? Um, 
you know, I started getting active in the Facebook groups and studying because I, I wanted to share some of this stuff. So I started making friends with people, exploring the doctrines with friends, um, going to some study groups here and there. And that's, that's kind of how I got involved in relationships with like you and Justin Griffin and some of those guys, some good friends of mine. Um, so that changed. Um, I did a lot more, um, a lot more scripture study afterwards and a lot more service. Like instead of just studying for selfish reasons, I wanted to study in a way that it was throughput. Spirit could teach me things, but I wanted an outlet where I could get back to being a missionary. I loved being a missionary when I was young. I loved preaching the gospel in people's homes and meeting people and testifying. And so part of that deal I made with the Lord, to hey, get me back to that place I was at when I was young, you know, 1920, is I felt that I had to get back on the missionary wagon and just do the best I can. I'm not excellent at it, but, you know, I die trying, you know. <laughs> Um, so missionary efforts were, were big. Studying the gospel was big. My prayers are different. They're not just a drive through window necessarily anymore. I do when I have my private prayers outside of family and meals and things like that. Um, I do focus on help me to eradicate this natural man out of me a little more. Like I'm, here's something I'm noticing that I'm falling short in. Can you help me with this? You know, and help me find other people that I can lift. The first principles, ordinances of the gospel, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, and then the gift of the Holy Ghost. Did you find yourself going through those steps anew? Not in any real strategic way, but I did know that I'd had this spiritual rebirth, but I I felt ripped off because I'd never got baptized with any heartfelt thing. When I was eight, I was dragged along by my dad, who was the bishop, Saturday morning. I was excited to get out ice cream afterwards. And it was, it was really, I thought that stuff was so boring when I was eight. I just did it because he wanted me to. But I felt ripped off and gypped that I didn't have a voluntary baptism to show the Lord that I want to follow your commandments. So, you know, uh, about a year ago, I got rebaptized, you know, by a friend. Um, and that was just a token to show the Lord that, hey, I'm in, you know. I'm not, I'm not willing to skip this step of choosing to be baptized in my life. Because the moment that the, the corporation, I use the term the corporation, I don't mean that to be insulting. I do mean it to be accurate, though. The moment that the corporation finds out, what do you mean that some adult who's a member of the church has gotten baptized again without asking our permission? It's perceived as you must be doing something that's apostate. Was that a worry of yours, how the church would perceive you getting baptized if they were to find out? I mean, I didn't want them to know about it because I knew it would be this big, big deal for them. And so I would, I mean, somebody called and tattled on me and said that I'd been baptized recently into a new church. And it's like, well, not really a new church, but just baptized into Christianity as a whole. That's what I was aiming for. Um, and so my bishop called me in and we talked and stake president interview a couple months later. And that was a concern for them, you know, is that. I was getting rebaptized. What did you explain to them? Christianity as a whole, you wanted to show that covenant with God? Well, same thing. I, I just brought up that, hey, when I was younger, this didn't really count. I, I was compelled to be baptized, but I didn't feel anything. you know. And now as an adult, and I've had this spiritual rebirth of sorts, and I'm making covenants with the Lord, and I'm trying to become his true disciple, I'm reading in the scriptures, you've got to be baptized by water, right? And by the Spirit. Um, so I am doing those things again as an adult to show that I'm committed to the doctrine of Christ, to how his they, gospel. How did they accept it? They understood. They were pretty cool about it. Um, they were concerned more about me starting a new church. I, it, I'm not. It's amazing you know, how rumors happen. It, basically, anything that happens outside of uh, this is the structure that we all know and we're comfortable with, and it has this much of the hamster wheel always turning. Anything outside of that, you must be doing something doing something to fight against the church. Did Have you ever felt like you were fighting against the church? Um, yeah, at times. Okay. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I, like I told my leaders, I said, look, I don't, I'm not going out to tear down the church. The church is just this thing, you know, lots of churches. Um, and it's helpful. It does some good things. However, if church tradition or policy or the commandments of men in any way shape or form, get in the way of the doctrine of Christ being taught effectively and accurately. I said, yeah, I will tear down those false doctrines. 
because I'm going to clear the way for truth to, to get in there. You know, As some people like, well, the everlasting covenant. Oh yeah. I've been there, done that. Uh, my wife and I got sealed when we were 21. Yeah. So check. And it, I don't bring up the, the everlasting covenant stuff unless it's in the way of someone understanding the true nature of it. And I have no problem rolling up my sleeves and tearing down the false traditions if they're in the way. Otherwise, I don't go out and pick fights just for the sake of argument, you know. Mm-hmm. But if it's in the way of someone coming unto Christ, yeah, game on. I will tear down false doctrine. We're going to turn this into a part two. <clears throat> and you and I are going to discuss, it's, it's going to be more back and forth because I want to get into the nitty gritty of, well, what is our situation today? What are some of these false traditions that have to be torn down that we have to at least become aware of? So tune into part two and enjoy the outro music. Being Friday, of course. (laughs) 